welcome to our video on the effect of temperature on morph variation in growth snails by Karel, Marijke, Sanne, Marco and Marva. The growth snail is one of the most common and colorful species of land snail in Europe. The variation in shell color within this species is called polymorphism. Morph variation in animals is widely used to study multiple processes, especially evolution. The growth snail is a popular species to use in these types of studies. A lot of researchers have observed and used the growth snail in experiments to investigate the effect of biotic and abiotic variables to explain morph frequencies. There are several natural selection pressures that are believed to drive these morph frequencies visual selection by predators, frequency dependent selection and climatic conditions. Temperature plays a key role in climatic conditions and hence several studies have investigated the effect of temperature on morph distribution. One example is the study of Osgo and Schildhausen, which found evolutionary changes in phenotypes over a 43 year period while the temperature over this period increased. In all the studies so far, a variation of variables has been investigated, especially radiation, but none looked at the sole influence of temperature. This leads to the question to what extent temperature drives the evolution of polymorphism in the growth snail, and are different color morphs physiologically adapted to perform better under certain climatic conditions? Grove snails have more than 200 recognized shell colors and banding variants. For research purposes, these are categorized. The main colors are yellow, pink and brown. Next to color variation, there is also variation in the presence or absence of bands and the number of bands present. Studies have shown that these different color morphs are found in varying frequencies in different habitats. The light-colored morphs are found in higher frequencies in warmer and open habitats, while the darker-colored morphs are higher in frequencies in colder and closed habitats. We support our study with the following mechanism. Natural selection pressures, like temperature, influences phenotype frequencies and feeding activity. Metabolism in snails goes faster at warmer temperatures, and the phenotype of the snail also influences its feeding activity. This study aims to identify the role of temperature in determining frequencies of phenotypes in the growth snail by performing a correlative field study comparing morph distributions from warmer urban areas and cooler field areas. And in addition, we perform a manipulative study exploring the relationship between phenotype and feeding activity on the three different temperature levels in the lab to see if morphs are physiologically adapted to certain temperatures. We set up the following hypothesis. 1. Darker and banded phenotypes warm up faster than lighter and unbanded phenotypes. This gives the dark and banded phenotype an advantage in cooler areas. We predict that the frequency of darker phenotypes of the growth snail increase with cooler habitats, while the frequency of lighter phenotypes increases with warmer habitats. Two. Lighter and unbanded phenotypes have a preference for higher feeding temperature. This gives them an advantage over dark and banded phenotypes in warmer areas. We predict a higher feeding activity for lighter unbanded phenotypes of the growth snail in higher temperatures than for the darker banded phenotypes. In order to investigate these interesting hypotheses and predictions, we set up a correlative field study and a manipulative lab study. First, we will discuss our field investigation. In the correlative field study, we collected data from two locations. One is an urban and warmer area in the middle of the city Wageningen. The other is an open field and colder area, het Binneveld. 
At both locations, a weather station is present, which enabled us to calculate climatic differences between the two locations concerning temperature and humidity over a longer period of time. We found that Wageningen City is 0.8 degrees Celsius warmer on average than het Binnenveld. In Wageningen and in het Binnenveld, plots were selected on expert judgment. Eight plots in Wageningen, the red flags, and 13 plots in het Binnenveld, the blue flags. Each plot was searched for snails for 60 search minutes. During the experiment, snails were more easily collected in the city center than in the open field. situation there was less suitable habitat resulting in more distance between plots. Therefore we searched more plots in the field than in the city to be able to test for statistical differences in phenotypic frequencies between snails in the city and in the field. From the collected grove snails the phenotype was determined and divided into six categories. Yellow unbanded, pink unbanded, brown unbanded, yellow banded, pink banded and brown banded. Juvenile snails were not taken into account because they haven't fully developed their color and banding. As you can see, an adult grove snail has a black or brown lip. The juveniles and a closely related species have a white lip. Results field experiment. Because we have count data, we used the chi-square test to determine whether there are significant phenotypic differences between the two locations Wageningen and at Binneveld. We found a significant difference with a p-value smaller than 0.001. The most remarkable result is the frequency of pink unbanded snails. The expected frequencies are calculated by the chi-square test based on the number of snails found at each location. In Wageningen, less pink unbanded snails are found than expected, while the opposite is the case in het Binneveld, where more pink unbanded snails are found than expected. Another remarkable result is that we found no snails in the category pink banded in het Binneveld, while these made up almost 14% of the snails found in Wageningen. Unfortunately, we cannot determine which categories differ significantly between the two locations because of the limitations of the chi-square test. We tested for effects of a set of variables on the more frequencies we found in the field concerning microclimatic conditions, sampling day and sampling time. We found no significant effects. The manipulative lab experiment was set up to test for the combined effects of temperature and phenotype on feeding activity. For this experiment we used the snails from the field study and additional snails to complement our snail numbers. The snails were divided into five categories. We did not find enough brown banded snails so this category was dropped from this experiment. We had three different temperature treatments, 13, 17, and 21 degrees Celsius. 30 snails of each phenotype were randomly divided over the three temperature treatments, 10 snails per treatment. As a control, two snails per phenotype were added to each temperature treatment. This resulted in a total number of 180 snails for our experiment, with 60 snails in each treatment. The temperature treatments were obtained by using a refrigerator for 13 degrees Celsius, a climate chamber for 17 degrees Celsius and closed boxes in a working room with climate control for 21 degrees Celsius. All treatments were dark and had a humidity of around 80% which is sufficient for snail activity. This leaves us with a balanced randomized design with two factors, three levels for temperature and five levels for phenotype. 
Before being placed in their respective treatments, the snails were not fed for three days to ensure empty bowels. After that, each snail was given a unique identification number, weight, and housed individually in a plastic cup with netting on top. in all treatments received a fresh leaf disc of lettuce daily. Each day the old leaf disc was removed photographed and replaced with a new one for a period of four days, except for the controls whom were not fed. After these four days the snails were not fed for three days again to ensure empty bowels for the second weighing. The photographed leaf discs, 600 photographs in total, four per snail, were analyzed using the free available software ImageJ, which can measure the surface of the remaining leaf disc. Results lab experiment. In the lab experiment, one snail ended up dead, so we removed the poor snail from our analysis. We used the two-way ANOVA to test for the effect of temperature treatment and morph category on feeding activity, which has been measured in square millimeters eaten. We checked for the normality of our residuals, homogeneity and equal variances, which were all okay. We started with square millimeter leaf disc eaten as our dependent variable and treatment, phenotypic category and the interaction between these two as fixed factors. Because of homogeneity, we were allowed to make bar graphs of our results, showing the average leaf surface eaten by snails divided by phenotypic category and temperature treatment. Only treatment was significant, so we decided to remove the interaction from our analysis but the phenotypic categories were still insignificant, so we removed these as well. We ended up with a p-value for the treatment of 0 0.001. We used the Sheffer post hoc test to determine which treatments were significantly different from the others. As you can see, only the snails from the 21 degrees Celsius treatment ate significant more from their leaf discs than the snails of the other two treatments. Therefore, we assume that a tipping point of the temperature effect lies between 17 and 21 degrees. In addition to feeding activity, we tested for relative weight gain or loss. On average, all the snails from the experiment lost weight. We used a pair t-test to test for these differences. As we expected, the snails from the control lost more weight than the snails from the experiment, which received a leaf disc of lettuce for four days. We didn't expect, though, that the snails which received lettuce would also lose weight. The relative weight loss within snails was significant for the experiment group with a p-value smaller of 0.001. The same result counts for the control group. We also tested for differences in relative weight differences between treatments using an ANOVA, but we found no significant differences. We did the same for phenotypic categories, but again, we found no significant differences. Also, for the combinations of temperature treatment and phenotypic category, we found no significant differences. We will use our mechanism to discuss our results. We did not find evidence that phenotype influences feeding preferences under different temperature regimes. This suggests that temperature and phenotype are not dependent on one another, and phenotype is independent from feeding activity. Temperature did have an effect on feeding activity. Our new altered mechanism is now as follows. 
At 21 degrees Celsius, the feeding rate is significantly higher than in snails subjected to the 17 and 13 degrees Celsius regime. All more variants have a higher feeding rate at the warmest temperature regime. This indicates that with warmer temperatures the feeding activity increases. However, there will be an optimal temperature where there is maximum feeding activity. And past this optimum, the feeding activity will decrease again. Another possible explanation for the fact that we were unable to detect differences in feeding activity between the 13 and 17 degrees Celsius treatments has to do with practical problems during the experiment. The intended temperatures of 13 and 17 degrees Celsius deviated to respectively 11 and 14 degrees Celsius temperatures. This caused larger differences between these two treatments and the 21 degrees Celsius treatment. It also caused smaller differences between the 13 and 17 degrees Celsius treatments. The relative weight increase did not differ between phenotype categories and also not for temperature regime. This provides us with evidence that although snails at a higher temperature eat more, they do not differ in weight changes. So the relative gain in weight of cold-blooded snails is counteracted by the higher metabolism with higher temperatures. Moreover, they use more energy and thus need more food at warmer temperatures. There is a significant difference in weight before and after the experiment, where the weight afterwards is significantly lower than before the experiment. This could be explained by the diet they followed. Lettuce is low in calories and so a loss in mass is likely. Also, our snails had not eaten for three days before weighing to ensure empty bowels. This is supported by our controls who significantly lost more weight than the snails who followed the lettuce diet. We can also conclude that the time span of the experiment has been appropriate because there is an effect observed. So what does our study entail and contributes? Several studies concluded that a warmer temperature correlates with higher frequencies of lighter unbanded color morphs. However, we do not fully agree with this conclusion and propose a slightly alternative hypothesis. Not temperature, but solar radiation causes this pattern in snail morph distributions. Our theory is that lighter, unbanded color morphs reflect more solar radiation and therefore get less warm than darker banded color morphs, who absorb more solar radiation. So the mechanism changes, and instead of temperature, solar radiation should be incorporated. This alternative hypothesis is supported by our results, which show that different morphs do not differ in feeding activity within different temperature regimes, which you would expect if the morphs are temperature dependent. In the warmer area, the city of Wageningen, we did not find a larger proportion of lighter unbanded color morphs than in the field, which also supports our hypothesis that temperature does not influence phenotype frequencies. Striking is the presence of pink banded snails which occur in the city but are absent in the field. Also, the higher than expected abundance of pink unbanded snails in the field is remarkable. Yellow snails do occur quite a lot in the field, which is in contrast with our hypothesis. We expected to find low numbers of yellow snails in the field. One explanation could be that there is less shade in the mainly open field area than in the more covered city area. This theory is supported by other studies. The more frequencies in the city supports our temperature hypothesis, but the field data shows a complete reversed pattern. So it seems that location is independent from more frequency. Another possibility is that the areas do not differ enough in temperature to observe differences in more frequencies, which is supported by our results.